Hi. So uh, I'm Julian. I'm coming from Switzerland, hence the mountains. Sorry I don't have chocolate for all of you. Um, I'm working for a MSSP as a kind of security architect or security expert, part of a team doing uh, applied research or technology scouting to, to know what would be the, the next step. Um, I'm going to talk about iOS malware, but the name of the company sounds like one of the AV vendor, but I'm not related to, to AV vendor, so it's not to sell you a new uh, product. InfoSec is uh, closed, but uh, not in this building. Um, and otherwise, I'm doing uh, also CTF and, and stuff like that. So today's talk will be about iOS malware. But if we looked into the news, most of the time what we heard since 2010 is a lot of stuff about Android uh, banking malware or information stealing software on Android. So you might say, OK, I, I've heard about a lot of them. So I've only picked a few there. But if we, if we looked at iOS, you might say, OK, it's not even a problem. It, because from a last year uh, Verizon DBIR report, they said that, paraphrasing Jay-Z, I got 99 problems, and mobile malware isn't even 1% of them. So what they basically said is, OK, but there is no mobile malware. And they, I highlighted something that is really hard to read. But what they said is, uh, all the suspicious activity related to iOS malware was, in fact, a false positive triggered on Android devices. Uh, so this is their point of view. Um, I tend to think that they might have um, some kind of uh, bias into the, the information that they had. Because if you look at all the companies working into their, uh, the, the report that they build every year, there is not that lot of uh, uh, company into uh, Asia. There is a lot of European and US companies, but not in, in, in Asia. This is where actually most of the iOS malware uh, are spread in, into the, for the moment, so publicly. Um, so it's more widespread than we, we might think. And the, the more at risk might be uh, companies, uh, especially the high profile ones, uh, where you might have some, some type of attacks. So if we looked, there are still uh, some types of uh, iOS malware that has been uh, published or discovered through the year. The first one was in 2009. It was named iKey. The idea was actually kind of a ransomware. But uh, what it did was uh, lock your screen and change your password, so your passcode. And if you don't, didn't pay uh, five bucks, then it will not unlock your password. How it spread, it was a worm. And it spread by using the default SSH account on iOS 1 when there was the first jailbreak. So, and the problem is that once you're even on a 3G or LTE network of operators, most of the time, there is no segmentation between all the devices. And you can directly access one another devices, provided that you know their IP address. This has been the problem, has been uh, recently shown in the news, so last summer, when uh, Charlie Miller uh, did the talk on uh, Jeep hacking, car hacking. I don't know if you, you've read the details. But what they did, they were able to actually access the, Jeep, the LTE modem of the Jeep because they were on the same provider network. So iKey was scanning for open SSH port. Then it's connected and uh, using the root and Alpine credentials. And then uh, that was it. Um, then there have been some other one in 2012 and 2014. But it, it was mostly some ad-related stuff and uh, not that much, and it wasn't that much into the news. But starting in 2014, the end of 2014, we have seen a lot more of them, like unflowed wire locker. Um, and then uh, we had a big one named Xcode Ghost that was in 2015. And that one made a lot of noise because it was also it was spreading through the modified version of Xcode. So uh, in the news, you, depending on which website you're uh, you're reading from, you would say that Xcode was used to spread malware. But in fact, it was a pirated version of Xcode that was used to spread this malware. Um, and what I found is that most of the time, it's quite hard to differentiate what was possible using a jailbroken or a standard device. And that's why I made this presentation, is to try to make it more clear between the two worlds. And uh, actually, most of the stuff discovered since 2015, so unflowed wire locker, uh, they have been discovered 
or published at least by uh, Palo Alto, and one of the researchers, uh, Claude Xiao, is doing uh, something great, is sharing all of the samples that they got to the community. So as I'm not directly related by my job into looking into malware, and I'm doing it at night, this is quite useful. And, uh, it profits the, the community to, to share those, uh, those, those um, binaries so we can, uh, we can reverse them and uh, learn from them. So just a quick recap on uh, iOS security. Uh, the first thing that almost everyone uh, is aware of is that uh, the platform is quite cloud compared to Android. It's not possible to self-sign your binary and push it into a device. So no, it's possible, but it's really new. Uh, it's something that you can do only from a, a few, few months, uh, actually, nearly, oh, nearly one year. Uh, but most of the time, you have those type of, uh, of access. The first one is the App Store. Uh, everybody knows about it. You buy or you get a free application from the App Store. It's downloaded. And then you have the binary. Um, no, it's not the full binary. It's uh, so there is an application, so sinning, and then you don't have all the, the binary for all the architecture that has been downloaded onto your phone now. Then you have a deployment, which is called uh, in-house. This is when you have enterprise develop application. So it's true, the, as a developer for an enterprise, you have to sign up for an enterprise developer account, which is a little bit more costly. You have to provide a specific uh, a number for the company, register into the US so you can prove that you are actually a company. But it's not the hardest part. And then you sign it, and the idea is that you, by getting this uh, certificate, you will say that I will only deploy it within my company. So usually it's not supposed to be deployed uh, widespread. So uh, this is something that you might have known from your own company if you have a MDM and you're using iOS as a base application. Uh, uh, devices for your, your employee, then you might have some uh, in-house developed application signed by an enterprise developer account. Then you have the jailbroken device, which is a third-party app store, but then you have to jailbreak your device, and uh, actually it disables some of the protections from the system, and then it allows you to bring on uh, unsigned code to the, to the device. Then you have a, a fourth uh, type of uh, deployment, which is named ad hoc. Ad hoc is to do some uh, debugging. Because as a developer, if you only have your device, it's uh, not that much. And you have, even if iOS is less fragmented than Android, you have various uh, version of the, the OS, you have various version of the phone, so you might want to check uh, that, for, that it works for everyone. And also get feedbacks as a developer. So what you can do as an ad hoc is uh, provide at, at mo most, most uh, 100 email address, or uh, so Apple ID, and then you can deploy those, uh, your application onto those, at most, 100 people uh, device. But there is a strong limitation. And then you have the new case since uh, last summer, which is self-sign. So using Xcode 7, now what you can do is request a self-signing certificate, and then you need to assign, to, so to really pair your device, not only pair like uh, you can access it through iTunes, but you have to say, actually state that your device is now acting as a developer device, and then you are able to uh, develop and sign your own application. You still have to, to have a Mac to, to do so, and use iTunes. So the jailbroken case is uh, quite specific because um, it can be used in the security industry as an advantage. Uh, I used to do uh, pen testing and uh, especially mobile application reverse engineering. Uh, to check the security vulnerabilities and uh, that everything is, uh, was, uh, was secure, either for the, the customer, for a custom build uh, solution or for a commercial solution that they want to, to use uh, to assess the security. So it's quite useful because if you don't have a jailbroken phone, you have uh, a lot of limitation. For example, all the binaries coming from the App Store, they are encrypted using a light DRM, but it's quite enough that if you get the binary signed, you uh, encrypted, you cannot decrypt it by, by yourself. So if you have a jailbroken, jailbroken phone, uh, it's quite easy. Uh, the packer is uh, really simple. You set a breakpoint. Once the, the code has been decrypted, uh, then you run the binary. The system will decrypt your, uh, your, your sign, uh, encrypted binary, and then you dump all the code from the, the, the memory. It's quite, quite easy, and then you have the, the clear text uh, uh, binary. 
Um, that's why it's quite useful uh, in the security industry. But there is one drawback, one major drawback, is that it disables code signing uh, validation. So for some people, it's a good point, because then you are able to get some free stuff out of other app store. You can install Tweak. You can install uh, uh, pirated copies of, uh, of some application, which is bad. <laughs> Um, but also, um, there is a, a problem because then you, you remove one of the, the core security principles that made the platform like um, Windows RT or iOS more secure compared to our laptops or desktop. Because we really have to bring on signed code that can be run, and it's some, not something that, you, that is usually done on the Windows or uh, OS X uh, boxes. I don't know if many of you have deployed AppLocker within their company, but uh, from my experience, at least in, in uh, Switzerland and France, uh, there is not a lot of them. So it's something that whitelisting application is not something that people tend to do, because there is a lot of uh, work that you have to do in the background to enable new version of the application and do some, <coughs> some stuff. So that's really one of the core principles of iOS, or Windows Archive was doing the same. And unfortunately, it's been stopped. Uh, but those are uh, core principles. So other than the code signing, uh, Apple is also putting other type of uh, limitation. One of them is the sandbox, uh, which is named Seatbelt. Uh, the idea is then every code coming from the App Store or any code running on the device has to be uh, to going through a sandbox environment. So it cannot do anything they want. So Android does that by using a uh, various um, user, and then is using um, the, the, the basic uh, user segmentation based on any Linux, that if you don't have the rights for a specific uh, folder owned by another user, you cannot access it. That's how they do the, the segmentation between all the applications. Uh, within iOS, is different. You have seatbelt, and then you have like a firewall, which is in place for the syscall, or some sp specific function call. And if you don't have the correct uh, privilege, you cannot call this API, you cannot call this syscall. Uh, it's as basic a, as that. And that's how they do the isolation for all the, the application. When you request an access, you have to bring it like part of your manifest. So you have to declare a specific file, which is an entitlement. And then you fill in all your entitlements. For example, if I want to access the calendar, I have to add the specific entitlement saying the I want to access the calendar. And then Apple will, re will review those entitlements, and there are some specific types that are disallowed into the App Store. So this is a basic check. If your application is, in is requesting the entitlement to install another application, because it does exist, uh, it will be re rejected by the App Store. And this is something quite easy for them to, to perform as a check, because there is no obfuscation that you can do in this part, because it's a... Uh, uh, XML, so plist file, XML or binary XML file. So there's really no obfuscation that you can do uh, at that time. So it is something that you can do. On top of that, uh, the sandbox seatbelt is supposed to um, prevent you, as I said, to calling API that you don't have access to. But there are some limitations. Uh, maybe you have seen in the news like two weeks ago, I think, uh, Stefan Esser, uh, one researcher on iOS, he published an application uh, for uh, two bucks something uh, in order to, to check if your device was jailbroken or not, or if you had suspicious uh, application running on your device. Uh, what he did to, to do that was to actually um, take advantage of uh, holes into the, the sandbox to call some uh, API that weren't supposed to be allowed. Like listing other processes is something that you're not supposed to be able to do on iOS uh, if you don't have the specific entitlement. But still, you find a flow that if you call a specific API you can, you, that is not well protected, then you will, you will, uh, you will get access to, to, to this information. So if we look at malware, uh, basically it gets to one root cause is people get infected. Uh, so. Most of the time, for the iOS world, uh, or mobile world as, as, uh, as a whole, it's uh, to lure user into installing the, the application, the message application. So what, they what the attacker will do is send a link or a message uh, with a download, download link, and then the user will click on the link and it will install the application. Um, 
I used this in a phishing campaign for a customer when I was doing pen test, and uh, I developed a small application saying that uh, in order to win a holiday paid by the company, you have to enter your AD credentials into the application. And then I had a 10% conversion rate of the people who downloaded the application and entered their AD, so Windows AD, Windows Domain, uh, credential into the application. Because I, was, I say that it was a game, and if you didn't enter your credential, we cannot check that you were part of the company, so you cannot enter the game to, to play it. So 10% is not that much, but still it shows that it, it proves that uh, people are doing or installing this type of applications. You would say that mostly on Windows, what attackers are using is watering hole attacks, and they are exploiting vulnerabilities within the browser. It's something that is also possible on iOS, like on any OS, since you have code, you have parsing code, then you have possible flows, so it's not something to rule out. But uh, remote code execution on iOS are quite expensive, in the sense that, at least publicly, there are not a lot of them. And uh, if we looked, okay, it's maybe also a peer stunt, but what Zerodium did is uh, offer $1 million for a remote code execution on iOS. So it's a bit of a peer to, to get people uh, talking about them. But it clearly showed that if there were so many remote code execution on iOS, it's not something that, uh, that they will price so high. So there is quite uh, um, the, the initial infection point for an attacker is not that easy if you don't go through the social engineering part. Then once you're onto the device, there is not that much public, but there is still a lot of vulnerability that allows you to evaluate, uh, to, sorry, to elevate your privilege on, on uh, the iOS using vulnerabilities within the kernel, within the module that is loaded by the kernel, or any privilege code. Otherwise, if you don't want to, to send the link, what has also been done, I've seen in the presentation uh, at various conferences, um, it, at least it was in, in Asia, what did was uh, some uh, uh, provider were attacked onto the DNS, and the attacker reroute the DNS traffic, and then they, they uh, pushed their malware into the web page that was supposed to be loaded. So they injected the, the, the link that way. Uh, otherwise, what I've seen also, what has been reported, and it was in China as well, is uh, moving with a, a fake inode B. So inode B is for LTE, so it's not possible to have a fake uh, inode B in LTE, but it's possible in, um, in a 3G. So in 3G, if you have a fake radio interface, uh, there is no mutual authentication between the device and the, 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 the radio interface. So what you can do, if, if I'm emitting a signal stronger than the one provided by uh, any uh, mobile telco, uh, then the phone will connect to me. Then I'm not able to do the full connection uh, to, to the, so I'm able to do the full connection to the telco. And what I can do as well is also push the binary onto the traffic. So that's also one way that people got infected. Then you also have physical attack. Um, one feature is called Mobile Device Framework. It's a feature from iOS. It's what allows you, when you plug your uh, iOS device onto your Mac, PC, Linux, it's a framework, so a library, that allows you to push application, to push files onto the device. It's uh, built in, but there are some unknown uh, Stuff. It allows you to install application, and it allows you to do some uh, process listing and to do some stuff like installing application can be seen also as malicious. Because one idea would be, as an attacker, you compromise the host, so the desktop, and then once the desktop is compromised, once an iOS device is plugged in, you generate a piece of code that will push the, the malware onto the iOS device. That's one way to, to install it. But it's not working only as USB, it's also working through Wi-Fi. So once your iOS device is paired with your uh, desktop or laptop, once they're on the same Wi-Fi network and has been paired before, then you are able as an attacker to push your code in, uh, through the device. And last summer also at uh, Black Hat, I guess, it was, there was a vulnerability uh, in AirDrop um, that allows you, if you're within reach of the Bluetooth signal of uh, an iOS device, then uh, someone can send you an iOS application that will be installed automatically once you reboot your phone. Because that was a, a flow within uh, AirDrop, and you didn't even have to accept the, the incoming file. 
Then you have a third type, which is code injection. There has been an article by FireEye, um, I guess, onto that. Uh, for example, there is a library for iOS that is called gspatch. And uh, from JavaScript, you can call uh, Objective-C uh, methods. And uh, what some developers are doing is uh, to hot patch some application. They are using gspatch, so they get from the web, they download piece of code, and then they hot patch their application, their binary. So it is something that can be seen as quite useful because then you will, uh, you will be able to patch your binary. But then if, for example, this is done in clear text, so not in SSL, and you do it from a Starbucks, then if an attacker uh, intercepts your traffic, then he will be able to push his uh, JavaScript code within your application. So this is an example with uh, an application from, uh, it's a defensive application from uh, Zimperium. And what they did was develop a small application from, uh, for Linux that will use actually this uh, mobile device framework and will uh, activate the um, installation proxy on the iOS device and will retrieve the list of all the installed application and then try to match the list of installed application against a blacklist of uh, application bundle. Uh, but then, again, if we look back, you I just said that there is a code signing validation. So even if I, an attacker, as an attacker, I'm able to push code into a device, then I still have the code signing problem to, to bypass. Uh, on jailbroken devices, that quite easily, because there is no code signing uh, done anymore. But on a standard device, uh, that's still a problem. Uh, so what I could do was sign my application as an ad hoc developer. But then I'm limited, because I can only target 100 people. And then I need their uh, email account, so iOS information. Uh, there has been some, 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 some uh, attacks done using this. And you also needed your UDID. Uh, but no, access to the UDID is blocked to application by Apple. So it's not something that's, been, uh, that's possible anymore. Uh, Really, if, you, if attackers are doing a really narrow and targeted attack, they might use this technique, but it's not widespread, at least uh, at the moment. Another option is to use the enterprise developer certificate. Because if you have an application that is signed with such a certificate, then you are able to install it onto any device. But even if you're not from this company, but still there is some uh, um, limitation so, or validation put in place by Apple. Uh, on at up to iOS 8, a user, had, once they download an application, they had to validate that they want to install an application, and then there was a second validation to be done the first time that you launch the application. So this, the first time that you run an application installed uh, and signed with an enterprise developer certificate, it will ask you, are you sure that you want to uh, run this application signed by, and then the name of the company. So then it's, it's up to the user. But for those of you who are doing pen tests and social engineering tricks and stuff like that, or doing um, uh, ITL desk during the, the holidays for the family, you know that people get tricked. And uh, that's a fact. Uh, now, since iOS 9, it's more complicated. Uh, Apple added a new step. So actually, if you install an application signed with an enterprise developer certificate, and the certificate has not been imported through your MDM solution, so your device is not controlled by a mobile device management solution, which push, pushed the developer certificate, then you have to go to the settings, search for the certificate, and actually enable it. So you have more steps to do, and that's their way to try to reduce this problem by making it uh, needed more, more, step, more steps so, so people won't do it. But still, if you offer them a free holiday, that's a problem. So if we looked for the code sign at an application, in this example, I used uh, a sample which was part of the Y Spector attack, which is named uh, Dapian. If you looked at it using CodeSign, which is an application installed on iOS, uh, on OS X, sorry, uh, we've seen that uh, the authority is defined as uh, iPhone distribution, and then I have the name of the company. So one hypothesis is that those companies which are taking part of the attack are not willing. What happens is apparently that the attacker are hacking into those companies, stealing their signing certificate, and then they are signing their malware with the enterprise certificate from this, uh, this company, and then spreading uh, to user. 
So this is something to take care uh, if you into information security for an end customer. Uh, your uh, signing certificate are part of your assets. Because if someone breaks into your uh, one of your developer accounts, and then he's able to download the signing certificate for the old company, then he's able to develop a piece of code that is will be trusted on all your iOS devices for the, for the company, or even further. And then you have a media impact that you have to, to handle. But then <clears throat> we said that there has been in the news a, a malware called Ace Deceiver. This one was said as a malware bypassing Apple code signing mechanism to say, OK, it's broken. Well, not exactly. What happens, actually, is that uh, if you read into the original post made by the uh, uh, Palo Alto researcher, um, what is made, actually, is that the application uh, had to be at least once published into, the apps, into one app store. Because there are several app stores that you, you push your application into, uh, Switzerland, UK, France, and then you or China. And then you choose which app store you want your application to be part of. <coughs> then what they did, for example, as an attacker, is say, OK, I will only publish my application onto the Switzerland uh, app store. And then I will only activate my malicious code when the IP address uh, for on the, so I will make a callback to a web service. And if the web service is not sending me back a token, a specific token, I will not activate the malicious code. So what you will do is using GYP and say, OK, if the device IP is not within Switzerland, I will not activate the malicious code. If, let's say, I want only to, to address, uh, to, to attack uh, people in Switzerland. So what did the attacker was, since all the, the sandbox made by Apple are uh, hosted into the US, what they did was, OK, if the IP address is coming from the US, and since we know that we're targeting only this country, so no, we will not um, send the token, and the malicious code won't be executed. And since Apple has too many applications to review each day, it's not possible to do, to do that by end. So either they do it automatically, or they can use the um, code analysis uh, stuff. So it should be even easier for them today, um, because if, as a developer, you enable the code scanning, what you will do is not push the compiled binary, but now from iOS 9, what you will do if you enable this code scanning is actually only compile it to half, half the binary, which means that for uh, LLVM, you will only get the LLVM intermediate language. And then the intermediate language is pushed to Apple. And then what they do with code signing, the idea is not to send you as a user all the binary for uh, ARM v7, ARM v9, uh, 64 bits, 32 bits, they will only set, compile you the specific binary for your device. And that's why they did, so they take only the, um, the represent, intermediate representation and then compile the application for a specific uh, piece of code. So for them, it should be easier. If you've seen the presentation before about uh, static code analysis from uh, LLVM IR, it should be easier to recreate the AST. And then from this AST, so the, the um, the, the, the call, tree, call tree of the application, uh, then to see if a malicious application is called or if something malicious happens. But still, there is many ways to do, to do obfuscation on iOS, especially since the language uh, Objective-C is uh, reflect, reflective. Uh, then you can call application uh, by using uh, um, the name. And if you obfuscate the name and you you get the token, so the key to deobfuscate the, the, the name of the function only on specific case, then you will, uh, you will not see, see that. And in the case of Ace Deceiver, what they did then was, on top of that, what they did, so their binary was pushed at least once by Apple. But then once Apple revoked those applications, so it was not anymore on any store. But still, one, they, the, the, the attacker and one of their binary signed by, uh, by Apple. So what they do, they did, was to use a, a flow within uh, the installation when you install an application from your PC or Mac uh, using iTunes. Because you, you, in this case, you are able to do a man-in-the-middle attack, and then you are able to bypass the check that once the application is installed, it checked by Apple if the application is still valid or not. So in this case, they do the man-in-the-middle, 
and uh, what they do was uh, uh, make the iOS device believe that the application is still valid for Apple, and that's how they push it to you. And the application is encrypted, but when you install it from iTunes, you, you get the encryption key is part of the bundle. So they push you their key to, to the bundle. So that's one way to, to, to install it into a malicious, uh, so to install a malicious application to a, to a device. Now if we looked into the, the actions, the first thing we can do is look at to the application deployed into the App Store really to see what is possible on the App Store and what is possible outside of the App Store on jailbroken device or enterprise sign application. So in the case of App Store, for example, let's say you want to do audio recording. It's a classical case when you can scare uh, really the C level, because if, if you say that in one of your meeting you are able to, to catch what is said, then for them it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, so you have an API, on the app, uh, for any application on, uh, on iOS. And from this API, what you can do is actually record the, the voice, so from the, from the mic. Um, application like Shazam are doing it. But what you, what you will say, uh, see is that if you put the application in the background, it's still able to record the audio, but then the user will have a ribbon, a blue or green ribbon that will uh, be highlighted, saying you that the application is recording audio in the background. So it's not that stealth for, a, for a, an attacker. So this one on the App Store, it's possible, but not that stealthy. Then you have the keylogging. Keylogging is also a big stuff, especially since iOS 8. iOS 9, 8 broke the, con the concept of extension. So you can have extension for the browser, like for example, you have ad blocker that are using uh, exten as an extension, and you also have keyboard. Uh, keyboards like uh, Swift. And then at the beginning, it was said that an extension is separated from the standard application. So there is no way for an extension to store file on disk, and there is no way for an extension to communicate with the internet. Because there is a big fear. Because if you install, the, let's say, Swift keyboard, and you don't trust Swift, what do you do? Because th they are providing the keyboard. So there is one stuff that is put in place by Apple. If you have something that is a password prompt, it will actually be the, the standard iOS keyboard that will be prompted. It's not the one that you installed. But the, the, um, the text input has to be marked as a password field by a developer. But there is also a problem, is that they say, okay, but it's too complicated. Let's say that the application would like to, the extension would like to access the internet so he's able to send what you type, do some machine learning on it, and then do some text prediction to get you more words uh, easier. And actually, that's what SwiftKey is doing, or uh, other extension like it. So then, if you go into the settings and allow full access for an extension, then the extension is able to access the file system and access the internet. So now, everything that you type into this key keyboard can be sent to the outside world. And actually, that's one of the tricks that use a hacking team in one of their uh, tools for iOS. That's how they, they did it uh, with a sign application. Then there is the pri private API. Okay, this has been in the news last year. Uh, more than 200 ap iOS applications, they are stealing information, they are using the private API. What is the private API? So actually, it's only stuff that has been forbidden by Apple. In the developer contract, they say you shouldn't call everything that is private. So it's symbols that are not directly published or uh, that are not documented. Um, but still, it should still be into the sandbox. So all, all of the calls to the private API should be blocked by the sandbox by, by default. But as I said before, there has been some flow into the sandbox. And now Apple needs to be getting around all those, uh, those flows. Um, those, uh, to, to get access to a specific um, call, as I said, you need an entitlement. Uh, like I explained before, you need to define, uh, said, okay, I request access to the calendar, I request access to the address book. There is a whole list that can be found on the new OS, OS 10 book. Uh, the, the, the guy writing this book made a, 
a whole list, and then you can see on a base system, base iOS uh, system, which application is using which entitlement. Uh, this is validated by Apple and then enforced by Seatbelt. So private API does not mean that you can break out of the sandbox. It's not that simple. Still, there have been some flow, but it's not, it's not that easy. And there is also a problem is that for Apple to detect if you're using actually, if you're actually using private API or not, is not that easy because as I explained, if you said, okay, I will only call the private API if my device is located in the uh, UK, but I'm a user in Switzerland, then it, it won't work. Your code won't be called. So for Apple, it's not that easy to, to check. And uh, there has been some flow into the mechanism, like I said, with uh, Stefan Esser, so Ionic uh, application that acted to list other applications, things like that. Uh, in this case, if we took one of the malware, also from Y Spectre, which is called No Icon, if you check and, and to the right that is asking, there is a right to install, browse, uninstall, and uh, remove archive. So this application is basically able to install other application. So this requires the Apple private, private mobile installed allowed SPI um, uh, entitlement with the install and so on. Uh, is something if you try to put it into your application and push your application onto the App Store, uh, this is a big no for Apple. This is something that they can detect and they will block your application. This is not, not complicated for them. But then there are other type of private API that don't need specific uh, uh, entitlements. If you want a list of the private API, you can use, uh, there is a GitHub made by Nicolas Serio, on, on, uh, a Swiss fellow who made a full list of all the private function. Or on a jailbroken device, what you can do is use the class dump uh, DYLD and then dump all the classes on a jailbroken device and then you from that, from that, you can check for all the symbols uh, uh, within private uh, stuff that are not published. If you want to call private API, it can be called either directly. It can be done through DLopen DLSIM if you developed it in uh, C, and then otherwise use Objective C. For example, if it's called directly, if you look into the import for a binary, you will see it directly, my code above. And then if you're using reflection, what you can do is I'm using actually the string and I'm building, like in Java, in Objective-C you can use reflection and then you're able to get a class from the name of the class and then get a pointer to a method owned by a class by using its name as well. So in this case, I've put all the, the strings in clear text, but as an attacker, they can obfuscate those strings. So simple XOR or uh, ROT13 or stuff like that. In the case of an in-house application, is different because entitlement won't be checked by Apple since it's not going to the App Store. So if, you, if as an attacker you are able to sign an application as Enterprise Developer Certificate, then you put anything you want into your uh, code, into your entitlements. And that's how they are able to make malware that are able to install other application into the, the, um, the device, even if the device is not jailbroken. And then it allows you more possibilities that what was using by the Y Spectre attack, for example, they are able to access the IMZ and EMA of the terminal. And that's why they said that it, the application are coped by uh, getting private information about the user. Because if you know the IMZ and EMA of a user, you have, uh, it's pretty strong to identify someone. Uh, you can also install application and access other private information like the MAC address of the, the device. And if you get the MAC address, then you can also infer some, uh, some stuff about the, the guy. Now there is also another type of, of malware, which is non-application based. Uh, maybe if you're using iOS devices and you have mobile device management solution, you're pushing profile, configuration profile onto your device. Most of the time is to configure the email access, is to configure the VPN, to, con to install corporate certificates onto the devices. But as an attacker, it can also be seen or used another way. An attacker can use configuration profile to install a proxy and say to the iOS device, from now on, you go through this proxy. And also, it is able to install a, a new CA. So if you go, even if your application is using a, a SSL or TLS, if the CA is installed and the application is not performing a strong validation of the, the certificate, uh, then 
is able to even get access to your uh, SSL TLS communications. And then also you can install something, uh, the certificate to deploy application later on. So this has also been seen in the, in the wild. Now, quickly the protection and detection. So detection is not as easy as, uh, as on uh, standard endpoints like uh, Windows and Mac. Um, because the, the, the system is, there is less privilege, uh, so m the privileges are more strictly enforced, and you cannot develop something like on Windows, most of the AV or Linux, they are running uh, using a kernel module. But on iOS, you can come to Apple and say, okay, I've developed a kernel module to do an anti-malware uh, solution. They won't say, okay, but uh, yeah, we have the application whitelisting, so we don't need that. So basically, there is no way for uh, someone at the moment to publish such a code. So that means that the AV ran at the same level as the malware. So this is a bit of a trouble. On the network side, this is even more complicated because on standard devices, you might say, okay, I will use uh, my IDS, my proxy logs, my uh, anything that you have on, onto your uh, network monitoring uh, stuff onto your network. But the problem with mobile devices is that they're mobile. So they might connect from the, the conference, they might connect from the Starbucks. So there is a lot of points that you might not cover. So one idea will be to have an always-on VPN. Uh, there are some provider doing that. Uh, and then you route all of your traffic to, uh, using the VPN through your IDS. But your IDS is uh, published so through the VPN. This is one way to do it, but then you have a problem with the if it's a bring your own device, it also means that the user, everything they do will go through this VPN. But then you have also container, like a good or other type of container, Sysmosoft. Then they are doing specific uh, flow only for, um, for the application. They are setting the VPN only for applications. So if you want the IDS-like feature, uh, I've looked, for example, but it came back to one year ago. I looked into what was presented into emerging threat uh, type of uh, IDS alerts. Uh, the rule said that they provide for Suricata and uh, Snort, but from the, they have some mobile malware type of rules, but mostly they are only for Android. So they are not a lot or any of them for iOS. Um, I may be wrong in, in that. And there are other stuff like Lockout, who is doing also uh, threat intelligence into this area. Uh, then what you, will all, what you can also do from an IDS is to detect non-corporate configuration profile. Because if one of your device is accessing a configuration profile file into the internet, and this profile has not been provided by you, you should block it, at least if you control the egress point of the, the mobile device. What you can also do <coughs> is to detect on the fly if an application is signed by an enterprise developer certificate. So any application downloaded to one of your uh, device, at, at least, same problem. It needs to be protected by your network monitoring solutions. If it's signed by another company, you block it. Because most of the time, there is no reason, except specific case, that one of your device should be running an application signed by, by another company outside of the App Store. So this is one way to, to detect it. Then, if you have an MDM or MAM solution, what you can do using the MDM is to get a list of installed applications from the devices. So then you get the list of the installed application, you get the bundle name, and then you match the bundle name against the blacklist uh, of, uh, of uh, names used by malware. But this is not, it's IOC on the chip because you don't have access to the hashes, you don't have access to a lot of stuff, you only have the bundle name. So basically the application name like uh, com.facebook. Uh, something. So it's not that, that good, it's quite easy. It's something that you can quite easily change as an attacker. Um, so that's one way to do it. If you're running it, if you want to check on your own device, you can connect it or pair it using a USB or Wi-Fi, and then you can install the tools named the iDevice Installer or iDevice Provision, and then from this tool on the command line, you're able to list all the application installed into your uh, iOS device. So that's one way to do it. From the iDevice provision command, you should be able also as well to uh, get access to the configuration profile installed onto your device. 
uh, but lately I've had some trouble to, to do it. And I think it's now blocked by, by Apple, but I have to, to check this. I haven't got time to, to dig into that. If you want to take it to the forensic point of view, if you have access to the iOS device logs and you, you get it through using a open source tools through uh, uh, the, 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 the case that you can uh, buy to, to get the, um, to do some forensic analysis on mobile devices, and then it's not something that we can see here, but you have two stuff to look for. It's install D and springboard. They are two of the processes or services that are, um, that are making uh, entry when you have a, a new application that is installed. For example, uh, Springboard will say, is the last one, it said that uh, installed application did change. So if you have this type of information, that at least that allows you to know that, okay, the guy got infected at that time. Then if you have also access to a backup of those devices, uh, you can infer stuff from, a, so let's say, side channels. Like for example, the battery usage, or the data usage, because you have uh, logs in form of uh, um, um, SQL, uh, SQL database onto the device, and in those uh, databases, you have uh, the battery usage, the data usage, and all other type of uh, statistics that are already um, made by applications. So if suddenly you, you get access to a device that you, you think is compromised, and you have a battery usage for a specific application that you don't know about, this is some, something fishy and that gives you hints to, to, to get. Uh, and then it also gives you the last executed uh, information. So that's from the forensic point of view. But then there is a problem with the acquisition because then if you want the binary, it's something more difficult. For example, if you get something from the App Store, it's encrypted. So before uh, up to, so before iOS 9, if you made a backup of your iOS device uh, using iTunes, you will get the binary uh, for the application installed into the App Store. But now, since there is the app syncing and all type of stuff, no, Apple is not providing the binary within the backup. Uh, it's not anymore there. But even, it's an um, App Store application, so they are encrypted. You, you cannot access the code. So even if a malware was from the App Store, you, weren't, you will not be able to, to access his uh, code and to analyze it, except if you have a jailbroken device uh, from, to begin with. But now there is a problem with enterprise signed application because enterprise application are not part of backups since the beginning. It's stated into the documentation from Apple, application that you have developed in-house or distributed to your user with enterprise provisioning profile won't be backed up or transferred to your user computer. So there is a big problem, because if you want to do some forensic and analyze what is going on, if you don't have a jailbroken device that you infect and then you retrieve all the binary, all the information, but you have a, a user that got infected, then you have a, a big problem to be able to extract the binary to, to analyze it. Maybe what we can see in the future are uh, scanning kiosk using USB. So when you're working into the, uh, the um, like you have with USB key, you have this type of this uh, kiosk where you plug in, plug in your USB key that you got at Itfons Infosec, for example, and then it will run uh, multiple malware on it, um, AV, sorry, and they try to detect malware. We might see the same stuff for uh, iOS devices maybe in the future, uh, or maybe an AV for workstation that will say, okay, we have a new feature, it, we, now we're scanning your iOS devices as well. For Android, it's more complicated because then you have to have uh, ADB enabled, and enabled ADB onto a non-developer device is not something that is recommended. Now, about the protection, the first one is quite easy. Uh, update your devices, but then you will say, okay, we don't know if it's supported, if you will crash my device. And then you have the hardening, so what you can do as an end user on the hardening side uh, are the best practices. So for example, disable airdrop is something that you can do using your MDM, uh, forcing a six digit passcode at least. And one of the most important stuff could be to actually do some user training and uh, tell them that if you install an application that is signed by another company, it shouldn't be installed into your, uh, your application. You should stop the process and call the, 
the IT help desk or the, the corporate security team uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but then in, you're putting the, the work onto the user. Okay. As I said in the beginning, uh, this is made mostly, I've been able to reverse engineer those binaries because I got access to them. And since I'm not actually uh, uh, performing active research on, on this, uh, this malware, uh, looking for, uh, on websites for binaries and stuff like that, uh, it's mainly due to, to this uh, Palo Alto guy that I got access to, to them. So that's it. <laughs>